this is a fascinating uh, subject, despite the fact that these lesions are relatively rare. They're interesting and important for us because they can present in a couple of different ways. One, they can be discovered incidentally on a, a CT scan, for example, done for a head injury. Uh, or they can present with symptoms of increased intracranial pressure and gait disturbance. Um, and the difference in those two modes of presentation is very important because we've learned that symptomatic colloid cyst must be treated because there is a small but finite risk that the patients can have serious neurological complications and death with this lesion. But we've also learned that incidental colloid cysts um, can be followed with serial imaging in a conservative mode so that we don't subject patients who don't require it to the risks of surgery. So let me go into that a little bit um, uh, with you. And, and I would give you a, an example of a couple of different cases that frame these issues. So first, you notice on the left, a 24-year-old woman with nausea, vomiting, and headache who has a 7-millimeter colloid cyst at the foramen of Monroe. Compare that case with the case of a 71-year-old woman who is found to have a 7-millimeter colloid cyst found incidentally uh, on, a, on an MR scan. These two cases are very different, and we'll go into the details on, on that in a minute. Now, we got interested in these questions here at Wash U and went back and looked at our 20-some uh, year experience with these lesions uh, at our center. And we identified 174 cases, of which 11 were uh, excluded. Uh, for because we had limited information and we centered on 163 cases. Now like most series of colloid cysts, about 60 percent of these were incidental and 40 percent were in symptomatic patients. And um, when we went to look at the various clinical findings and indicators that would indicate which patients would become symptomatic versus uh, those that are incidental, we found a number of findings including age, cyst diameter, cyst volume, Evans ratio, headache, and the presence of a high signal on the FLIR series on, MI, on, M, on an MRI, um, as well as the anatomical risk zone where the lesion occurred all as being important indicators uh, of, of what the risk was for these patients in terms of being symptomatic or having hydrocephalus. So let's review the important indicators that determine which patients will be symptomatic and which patients will be found incidentally. The factors that we associated with symptomatic colloid cysts were age less than 65, the presence of a headache, a cyst diameter of greater than 7 millimeters, an Evans ratio of greater than 0 0.3, hyperintensity on the flare sequences, and a lesion occurring in the anterior segment of the third ventricle. We also determined some interesting findings with regard to our incidental patients. 58% of these were followed with serial imaging, and progression was noted in 8%. We define this as an increase in the cyst diameter of more than 20%, and symptom progression, including new development of ventricular megaly, severe headache, or cognitive impairment. So 8% got worse during our period of observation. Interestingly, we noted that two patients, or about 3%, had a regression in the size of their lesions over time. With regard to the important finding of hydrocephalus in patients with colloid cysts, 
we also identified a number of important risk factors for the development of this, including high signal on the flare uh, images. Age less than 65, the presence of headache, a cyst diameter of more than seven millimeters, enlargement of the ventricles, and uh, hyperintensity on the flare sequences were also associated with a more likely presentation with hydrocephalus. With regard to the relationship between hydrocephalus and cyst diameter, we found that uh, as the group of patients who had enlarging cyst diameters, they were much more likely to have hydrocephalus as the cyst diameter ranges from 7 to more than 24 millimeters. We correlated cyst diameter to cyst volume, and of course there was a, there was a, a significant relationship, but we were interested to note that a couple of our patients with the largest cyst volume were not symptomatic and were not associated with hydrocephalus. And as you see on this slide on the right, if the pattern of growth of the colloid cyst was through the foramen of Monroe into the body of the lateral ventricle, it was much more likely to be associated with a benign clinical course than if the growth pattern was down into the center of the uh, third ventricle. Here is the finding of increased flare signal uh, in a colloid cyst at the foramen of Monroe, and uh, flare hyperintensity was strongly associated with hydrocephalus uh, in, our find, in our study. This may be due to the fact that hemorrhage and or another event that occurs in the natural history of a colloid cyst is associated with uh, increased protein content. Interestingly, uh, the radiologists have determined that increased flare and T2 signal are related to the protein content in the cyst. And this may imply that either a hemorrhage or some other um, development in the pathophysiology of these cysts leads to um, changes which make them symptomatic and are associated with high protein content. The last clinical characteristic that I want to stress is the anatomic risk zone. We divided the third ventricle going from anterior to posterior into three zones, one, two, and three. And most colloid cysts occur in the risk zone one, which is adjacent to the foramen of Monroe in the anterior part of the third ventricle. Rarely or relatively in an unusual situation, the um, cysts can grow in zone two in the middle of the ventricle. And even more rarely, uh, it can be in zone three in the uh, posterior part of the ventricle. When we looked at the association of hydrocephalus with the risk zones, we noted that there was a, a marked uh, tendency for risk zone one and three to be associated with hydrocephalus uh, in a very significant number of uh, patients. An interesting patient that we encountered in our series was this patient who was a 52-year-old man who fell and then developed gait instability, headache, and cognitive decline. When he presented a couple of days later, CT scan showed a markedly enlarged ventricular system related to a lesion in the uh, uh, posterior third ventricle. Um, and an MRI scan confirmed that the aqueduct was occluded in the posterior third ventricle in this very unusual uh, sudden presentation of a colloid cyst. This led us to develop the colloid cyst risk so score. And this is a relatively simple tool that looks at the patient's age, the presence of headache, the diameter of the cyst, whether it's positive on flare, and what the risk zone is. And to each one of these, we assigned points ranging from zero to one. When the risk score was five or four, the patient was very likely to have been in the symptomatic group. Again, when the risk score was four or five, 
the patient had a high incidence of developing hydrocephalus. And this score proved to be very useful in terms of its uh, sensitivity and specificity with uh, an area under the curve between 85 and 90 um, uh, on the receiver operating curves, indicating that it's probably a useful uh, uh, test for us to be thinking about. So with regard to the interpretation of the colloid cyst risk score, the score can range between 0 and 5. If it's less than 2, the lesion is at low risk and clinical follow-up with serial imaging is indicated. If it's greater than four, the lesion is at high risk and surgery is indicated. If it's three, it's an intermediate risk lesion and very close clinical follow-up is probably indicated for most of these patients. So let's go back to those cases that we talked about at the beginning, um, the two cases that I showed you, both with seven millimeter cysts, one occurring in a symptomatic patient who is young and the other as an incidental finding uh, in an older patient. Um, the lesions were flare positive and negative, respectively. They occurred in zone one and two, respectively. And the first patient had a college cyst risk score of five, and the, latter, the, the, the older patient had a risk score of one. You can see what happened to the patient who had the high colloid cyst risk score as she developed progressive hydrocephalus over a short period of time um, in between 2009 and 2011 and ultimately had to have surgery. So we think the colloid cyst risk score is a useful tool for us in evaluating our patients. So what did we conclude from our study? Uh, first of all, we found that both enlargement with symptomatic progression occurred in 9% of patients, but some patients had regression of colloid cysts. So this underscores the fact that a relatively small number of patients who we follow with colloid cysts will become symptomatic and they need close follow-up. About half of the patients um, who had symptoms presented with obstructive hydrocephalus. Death due to acute obstructive hydrocephalus is a relatively unusual phenomenon occurring in 3% in our series. And we think that the colloid cyst risk score is a useful clinical tool that can, that can be used to identify symptomatic patients and stratify the risk of their developing hydrocephalus. Surgical intervention should be considered strongly for all patients with a colloid cyst risk score of greater than four. So let me finish up by describing to you briefly some of the surgical techniques that can be used to resect these lesions. Uh, a lot of detail on this is presented in the chapter and you can refer to that. The open or microsurgical management of these lesions is accomplished either by a transcortical approach to the uh, anterior aspect of the lateral ventricle uh, or through an interhemispheric transcolosal approach uh, to uh, expose the anterior part of the ventricle and the foramen of Monroe. And this brief video shows the microsurgical interhemispheric transcolosal approach to the foramen of Monroe. And as you can see, we've um, coagulated the wall of the cyst. We have opened it and are evacuating the viscous cyst contents. And then our dissection continues posteriorly to identify the attachment of the cyst to the velum interpositum, care being taken to protect the deep venous structures um, which drain into the internal cerebral veins bilaterally. This approach allows excellent bimanual dissection of the cyst and is said to lead to higher degrees of complete cyst removal.
um, as a result of this technique. Now, another approach is represented by the endoscopic approach. Here you can see a um, 13 millimeter colloid cyst at the foramen of Monroe. Um, we make a small incision, but plan a larger one in case we have to convert from an endoscopic to an open procedure. In this uh, video, you can see the endoscopic approach using a uh, bug B wire to uh, coagulate the wall of the cyst. Then we enter the cyst, evacuate the cyst contents with a reciprocal um, uh, dissecting device. And we're able to obtain, in most situations, an excellent removal of the cyst from its attachment to the velum interpositum. It is said that the endoscopic approach is associated with less complete removal, and that's an area of controversy with regard to selecting the surgical approach. And as you can see here, we've made a septostomy to connect both lateral ventricles through the septum pellucidum using the endoscopic technique. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about our chapter uh, in the eighth edition on colloid cysts, and uh, it, it's really been uh, a pleasure to have you here, Dick. Thank you very much.